This episode is brought to you by Aura. Hi, welcome to another episode of Cold Fusion. Every generation or so, a silent killer emerges, threatening our environment and the well-being of humanity. The dangers are not obvious to society until it's too late. From asbestos in the early 20th century to lead-laden paints, and now, in 2024, microplastics. Media headlines are awash with alarming statistics about the amount of plastic infiltrating our bodies. For example, we may consume up to a credit card's worth of plastic per week. Well, the World Health Organization is raising a red flag over plastics in drinking water. Leading US government scientists told CNN plastic is definitely in our food chain and drinking water. Well, well, well. Researchers are now looking into how there could be dangerous microplastics in those bottles. In this video, we dive into the truth about microplastics. Are we facing a genuine threat to humanity or is the panic overblown? In this episode, we'll find out. As a side, I've been on the internet long enough to know that there's differing opinions when the word environment is mentioned. I'll just be presenting the facts so you can get an understanding on microplastics and the potential risks to the environment and your health. You are watching Cold Fusion TV. Before we continue, let's hear a quick word from today's sponsor, Aura. Microplastics may be a danger to human health, and scientists are doing their best to understand the problem, but there's also dangers in the online world. Ever received a text that's trying to trick you into clicking a phishing link? What about spam emails and phone calls? The answer is most likely yes. Congratulations then, your information has been sold to data brokers. They're making a fortune by selling your information to robocallers and spammers. They can know a lot about you, including your name, phone number and address. And that's where today's sponsor, Aura, comes in. They can identify data brokers and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to, but they make it super hard to do. Let Aura handle that for you. Aura also does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats you can't see. It's really easy to set up, so you don't need to download several different apps to get things like parental controls, antivirus, a VPN, password management, identity theft and more. You get everything at an affordable price. Visit aura.com slash coldfusion to get started on a two week free trial. Offer only available in the United States. Pause for a moment and look around. How many things do you see that are made of plastic? I bet it's more than you can count on both hands. Most of these items will eventually be microplastic. Microplastics are simple in theory. They're defined as plastics less than five millimeters in diameter smaller than your standard pearl or the eraser on a pencil. There are two types. Primary microplastics are deliberately created for things like exfoliator scrub beads or as microfibers and clothes. Then we have secondary microplastics. These are created when discarded plastic items like drink bottles break down due to exposure from the sun's radiation or mechanical friction like ocean waves. The main problem is that plastic is such a tough man-made material that nature can't effectively break it down. Plastic fragments can stay around essentially forever, only getting ever smaller. There is one industry that really kickstarted the plastic revolution. Take a guess at what it was. Snooker. It all began with a quest for durable materials for snooker balls and billiard tables. Enter John Wisely Hyatt, who created the first synthetic polymer in the 1860s as an alternative to natural ivory the original material, and that's because it was putting a strain on the wild elephant population. Then in 1907, Leo Bakelin invented Bakelite, the first fully synthetic plastic, and this was followed by neoprene, invented by DuPont scientists in 1930. Then World War II started, and plastic production exploded by 300%. It was used in everything from aeroplanes to parachutes. Fast forward a few years, and the war ended, but there was still this huge plastic manufacturing capacity, and nothing to do with it. So what did they do? Manufacturers tapped into the only market capable of matching the demand, consumer products. Tupperware conquered pantries and birthed its own party scene. Cellophane dominated the packaging industry. Polyester clothes could be machine washed. And you know what comes next? Plastic production and usage continued to grow with globalization, as did waste and pollution in landfills and oceans. As time wore on, corporations put the onus on us and made us feel that we weren't doing enough and we could just recycle our way out of the problem. But that's a story for another video. 
In his book, Poison Like No Other, How Microplastics Corrupted Our Planet, Matt Simon describes microplastics as the, quote, pernicious glitter that has bastardized the whole earth, a forever residue from the party that is consumerism. Despite innovations in recycling and public awareness since the golden age of plastic, the issue of microplastics isn't going away. And here's why. Firstly, we now know that microplastics have infiltrated every corner of the world, from Antarctic sea ice to ocean trenches. Microplastics can pass through water filters and are dangerous to aquatic life. They can act as carriers. Once ingested by marine organisms, microplastics act like a Trojan horse. They can bind with other harmful chemicals, and together, both plastic and chemical, two peas in a pod, work their way into an organism's digestive system. And this is not good. Just take this study on nematodes. When exposed to microplastics, their lifespan shortened, their growth stunted, and their offspring count dwindled. It all starts at the bottom of the food chain. Plankton consumes microplastics. Crustaceans and smaller fish consume plankton, and the contamination continues up the food chain, eventually getting into the food that you and I eat. But wait, seafood lovers don't freak out just yet. And vegans, this issue still impacts you. Microplastics aren't just infiltrating the food chain, they're making their way into our bodies by other means. The main exposure route? Surprisingly, indoor inhalation and drinking from plastic bottles. Researchers at the University of Plymouth compared the risks of eating contaminated wild mussels versus inhaling household air. The findings were quite surprising. People are more likely to take in plastic from airborne microfibers shed by clothes, carpets, and furniture than from eating mussels from the sea. That's pretty wild. In 2022, Dutch and British scientists found microplastics in unexpectedly and previously unreported spots, deep in patients' lungs and circulating in anonymous donors' blood. Microplastics and nanoplastics can be tiny enough to penetrate the biological barriers of the skin, and also the gut and the placenta. Essentially, we are all now partially made of plastic. As mentioned at the start of this episode, the WWF suggests that we consume up to a credit card's worth of plastic each week, but other studies dispute that. Another study published by the ACS says that the amount we consume is in the range of a few micrograms weekly. It's better, but obviously still isn't ideal. Scientists fear that microplastics are a ticking time bomb. Now the question is, could they cause serious health issues like inflammation or cancer, or are they harmless? Do they simply get excreted, or do they act as endocrine disruptors, messing with our hormones? These are mysteries that need solving, not just for us, but for future generations. So what is taking so long? Here's where things get complicated. We're not quite sure about the health implications yet. Sure, there have been animal studies, but they're pretty unreliable. Why? Because 94% of drugs that pass animal tests fail in human trials, so we'll skim over this quickly. Studies on rodents show that microplastics can accumulate in their tissues, especially in the testes, risking reproductive health and sperm quality. Other studies have found that microplastics can make their way into tissues of marine animals, like whales, and even move from one part of their body to the other. But it's important to note that this study was limited, analyzing only deceased specimens. Current research investigates whether accumulated microplastics in our body could trigger an immune response or cause toxicity. Other studies explore whether microplastics are related to the rise in obesity rates. And this is where we need to take a step back. Before we rush to link conditions like ADHD, obesity, and mental health issues to a surge in microplastics, and before the media converts uncertain risks to actual risks, let's pause, tread carefully, and understand why drawing definitive conclusions about microplastics is so complicated. We'll keep this as concise as possible, but there are plenty of resources linked below. Number one, measuring the impact of plastics on human health is trickier than animals. We just can't intentionally feed people plastic. Number two, current research has only dealt with small groups. Number three, in one single plastic product, there can be over 8,000 different chemicals. This makes it very difficult to work out which ones are harmful. Additionally, microplastics are coated with bacteria and acids from the environment. They enter our bodies and mix with everything inside of us. 
Number four, most research so far focuses on the big stuff, not the tiny particles that pose a real respiratory risk. Hard evidence is scarce. Plus, although it's not a good thing, humans have been breathing in foreign particles daily since the Industrial Revolution. And number five, the presence of a chemical in tissue isn't an automatic red flag. Some, of course, are. High concentration particles have been linked to lung disease and scarring in the workers in nylon factories in Canada and the United States. But at lower levels, there's a massive question mark hanging over how much exposure is too much exposure when it comes to microplastics. But while we're here, we should talk about the chemical BPA. Some of you may have heard of it, but if you haven't, get ready for a wild ride. BPA, which stands for bisphenol A, is an industrial chemical used in plastic products since the 1950s. BPA is found in polycarbonate plastics and epoxy resins. That's everything from water bottles to food containers. But that's not all. Epoxy resins are used to coat the inside of metal products, such as food cans, bottle tops, and even water supply lines. Unfortunately, the BPA chemical can leach out of products and into the food and liquid that we consume. According to the Mayo Clinic, quote, exposure to BPA is a concern because of the possible health effects on the brain and prostate gland of fetuses, infants, and children. It can also affect children's behavior. Additional research suggests a possible link between BPA and increased blood pressure, type two diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. There is some evidence to state that BPA chemical exposure is affecting fertility in both men and women, causing children to start puberty early, and is also linked to some cancers. Keep in mind that research in this field is still ongoing, so this isn't definitive, but it's worth being aware of the risks. That being said, if you do trust the FDA, they state that BPA is safe at low levels, but if you don't trust them, you can reduce your exposure by either using BPA-free products and avoid heating BPA products that will be used for food. Use glass, steel, or porcelain containers wherever possible. Despite plastic going through a PR crisis right now, it still can be incredibly useful, not just for saving time or last night's dinner, but for saving lives. In healthcare, disposable and plastic-based medical devices prevent cross-contamination. Plastic plays a crucial role in food distribution, supports industrial agriculture, and dictates what we wear, with over 60% of textiles being synthetic and made from petrochemicals. The question is, how do we make it safer? Holding the oil and gas or chemical companies accountable for microplastics might seem like the obvious route, but awareness of the issue, and hence a lack of political appetite, make sweeping changes unlikely. If we just focus on the ocean for a second, where is all the microplastic coming from? Surprisingly, not the United States or China, but overwhelmingly the Philippines, followed by India. Focused local efforts in these regions could do a lot to help, To really get things moving with regulations and innovation, experts must first tackle some key questions. What alternatives are available? And at what cost? Are there better options with fewer drawbacks? The good news is that biodegradable plastics do exist and the best of them is called PHA. It fully breaks down in a matter of months instead of hundreds of years. An increase in the use of PHA products could curtail a future health crisis. The only catch is that it costs 25 to 80% more than conventional plastic. Hopefully, with further innovation, we can get this cost down. Despite the complexities and unknowns surrounding microplastics, emerging research and awareness is driving action. We've seen the US ban microbeads in consumer products. We've seen France mandate microfiber filters in washing machines. And other countries worldwide are ramping up efforts to reduce single-use plastics and encourage recycling although that might not be as effective as first thought. But that's another story for another video. Let's be clear, this is not totally our fault as consumers. And we don't have to sit back and just be guinea pigs. We too can be part of the solution. According to a study involving 73 experts, the immediate solutions lie in policy and behavioral measures rather than technical ones. Digging into the study, the solutions endorsed by experts as, quote, above average effectiveness, are things you probably already know and are on board with. Educating consumers to make plastic smart choices, installing filters in washing machines, encouraging the return of plastic bottles for deposits, simplifying product designs, embracing a circular economy that promotes product reuse. 
bring your own coffee cups and shopping containers. As for now, the risks of microplastic may not be widespread yet, but the consensus is building that it's a matter of when and not if. Dr. Albert Rizzo, Chief Medical Officer of the American Lung Association, fears that microplastics could be our generation's smoking issue. Will the actual harm only be apparent when it's too late? Quote, I can see plastics being the same thing. Will we find out in 40 years that microplastics in the lungs led to premature aging of the lung, or emphysema? We don't know that. In the meantime, can we make plastics safer? Another reason that this is so urgent is that in 2020 alone, 367 million metric tons of plastics were produced, a number expected to triple by 2050. There is now more man-made material on Earth than there is biological material. We're on a plastic production treadmill that's speeding up fast, and jumping off is not going to be easy. It's not just the environment, but it's our health that's on the line too. Are we really just expected to be human guinea pigs in this plastic experiment? Even though this issue isn't political, some may write this off as environmental mumbo jumbo, but there's a potential health risk to all of us. It's a wake up call, but not to panic, but to be aware, smarten up and step up. If you can remember just one thing as you finish this video and then go about your everyday life, it's this. Every piece of plastic removed from the sidewalk can mean reduced amounts of microplastic in our waters and ultimately in ourselves. Anyway, that's about it from me. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I think it's a huge issue that isn't being talked about enough. Anyway, if you did like this and want to see anything more on science, technology or business, feel free to subscribe to Cold Fusion. It's free. My name is Dagogo and you've been watching Cold Fusion and I'll catch you again soon for the next episode. Cheers guys, have a good one. Cold Fusion, it's new thinking.